Okay, thanks for joining everyone. I'm going to get, a, get started. Uh, I was attempting to uh, make it so the chat uh, could see, so you could all see each other and uh, chat amongst each other as we had talked about on the forum, but I don't see a way to actually enable that in the, the mode that the uh, meeting is in, so uh, I wasn't able to do that. Uh, I will definitely test that out uh, in advance next time. I thought I knew exactly how to do it, but apparently not. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the uh, introduction to packet analysis. Uh, first, uh, a bit of project news. We're uh, working on getting our first training course out. Uh, we have a, uh, an outline together and uh, are looking at a date uh, somewhere roughly towards uh, the end of July. And the uh, first one will be here in, in Austin, Texas. And the uh, subsequent ones uh, may be here or uh, elsewhere, depending on uh, demand and, and the, uh, the location of those who are uh, interested in attending. We have uh, about a handful of people in, uh, in London who are uh, interested. We would need maybe another 10 people or so to uh, make that uh, trip worthwhile. Uh, so if you would be, might be interested in a, a training course in London, uh, get in touch with us. Uh, that would uh, help us if we can just make sure that we uh, have enough uh, attendees to, to make it worthwhile. Uh, you just email gold at pfsense.org. It'll uh, get to the, the right people here. So under this month's topic, uh, packet analysis. So Actually examining what's on the wire of the network is an extremely effective means of, of troubleshooting any kind of, of network problem. You know, the, what the, the bits on the wire don't lie, uh, with some exceptions for occasionally broken hardware. But generally speaking, what's, uh, what's on the wire is uh, you know, what's, what's really on the network, and you can uh, prove a lot by uh, seeing what things are, are going where. It's... Uh, one of those things that a lot of times when I'm talking to our support customers, they uh, go, oh, wow, I wish I, I understood this stuff like, like you do. And it, some of the more complicated things are do require a lot of in-depth knowledge and can get really complex. But it, it doesn't have to be that way. There's a lot of various troubleshooting things that you can do without understanding all the protocols in great depth. Uh, and that's the, that's the goal for here today. Uh, Greatly oversimplifying um, some certain things and just uh, ignoring some things just to cut it down to something that's uh, very useful and is adequate for troubleshooting all the most uh, basic types of issues. So there's lots of various bits and pieces um, involved in, in packets when you're looking at them from the uh, perspective of a packet capture. Uh, for the basic things, we're going to be looking at uh, three different layers. Uh, at layer two, the source and destination MAC addresses, and those are unique to uh, each broadcast domain. So on the WAN side, they're different than what they are on your LAN side. Uh, anytime it uh, crosses from one network into another, uh, the MAC address source and destination will change. Uh, so that's not something that makes it all the way across the internet, uh, but it is very useful in making sure things are sourced uh, from and destined to the uh, appropriate devices. Um, at layer three, the source and destination IP addresses are uh, what we're primarily interested in, in uh, for basic troubleshooting purposes like this. And then at layer four, the the protocol in question. Uh, we're going to talk about TCP, UDP, and ICMP uh, today. And those are the most common things that you'll encounter. Uh, there are a wide range of other um, protocols as well. That that's uh, oh, we'll we'll have time to to get into today. First, an uh, introduction to uh, TCP in, in general. Uh, it's a connection-oriented protocol, so it actually uh, establishes a connection before it sends any kind of data across. It has uh, source and destination ports, and the source port is virtually never the same as the destination port. 
the source port is picked out of the ephemeral port range, which, depending on your OS, is somewhere in between a range of 1024 to 65535. Uh, some people get confused and think uh, that the source and destination port are the uh, same thing and configure their firewall rules accordingly and then uh, wonder why they don't match. Uh, it, it's very rare that you'll have um, any kind of circumstance with, with TCP where the source and destination ports are actually the same. The uh, first part of a TCP connection is the TCP handshake. And there are a variety of flags in TCP and uh, understanding the entirety of a uh, TCP connection is more than what we have time for but today, but the, the, the main thing that you really need to understand is the handshake portion. The, the first three packets, and if those first three are successful, then you have an established connection. So first, the, the client sends a SIM to the server, and then if the server is listening on that port and accepts a connection, it will send a, a SYNAC in response, and then the client will send an ACK back to the server. And at that point, the TCP connection is uh, established and ready to go. So here's a, some, some basic capture scenarios. There's essentially three different end results that, uh, that you might see whenever you're looking at a packet capture of uh, TCP traffic. Uh, first is uh, a connection that was established successfully. So in this case, we have a, a device at 10.2.5.1 that's using a source port of 11582. And it's going to destination IP 10.2.5.103 and port 22. And here we see that it's a SIM. So this is the uh, first packet uh, in the connection. And then the next one, we see that the server replies back. Its source port is 22. It flips the, it takes the original destination port. It makes it its source. And the destination IP is uh, the original source IP. And the destination port is the original source port. And then the flags are SYNAC. And then the client sends an ACK back to that. And at that point, those, those three packets uh, establish the TCP connection. And then they go on and, and send data from there. So generally speaking, if you are capturing a, a TCP session and you see all kinds of back and forth like this, it's the TCP, at least, uh, at the network level is, is functional. So the, the issue is probably not uh, at the, the, the network level in that case. Yeah, it, it could be, but it's not at least that it has absolutely no uh, ability to communicate. It, it, it does have uh, the ability to communicate bidirectionally if you uh, end up with a, a whole TCP session like that. The Uh, I've just been told that these slides may not be showing. I should be sharing my whole desktop, aren't I? Well, let me try that again. Okay, so that uh, did not turn on. Let me go back uh, a little bit here so you can actually, you know, see what I'm talking about. Ah, that was all the chats where they were popping up. I didn't have a, a way of actually seeing those. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, Okay, I'm a, I'll go back to here. Um, so just to, to show the, the illustration of you know, what we're looking at at uh, layer two and, and, and layer three. So the, uh, the source MAC and the destination MAC, source IP and destination IP. And then once you actually dig into the um, layer four protocol, that's where uh, it uh, has some additional protocol specific things that we'll uh, get to in the uh, back to in the next slides here. So here's the uh, 
So here's the uh, established TCP connection I was talking about, where the uh, client IP is uh, the 10251, its source port is 11.582, and the destination host, the uh, SSH server in this case, is uh, 10.2.5.103 and port 22. And you see here the flags that that's a sin. So that's the that's the first packet uh, to establish the TCP connection. And then the server replies back uh, from its IP, and its source port is 22. So it takes the original destination and flips it back to the source, and it sends it back to the client with a destination port that was its original source port. And then the flags are SYNAC. And then the client. Uh, replies back to the server and with flags ACK. So those are the three packets that establish the TCP connection. So you have functional uh, bidirectional connectivity uh, after you get past those first three and then you'll see from there that uh, even if you're doing very little you'll have a whole slew of packets uh, past that point. And then the second possibility is a, a connection that you attempt to make gets rejected by the destination host. So this is uh, essentially a, a similar uh, circumstance to before, trying to connect to SSH, um, and it sends a SYN. But instead of getting a SYNAC back, in this case, we get uh, the destination IP import flip back to the source, and uh, the original source IP import is now the destination, but the flags are reset ACK. So that's uh, that's TCP's way of saying there's nothing listening here. So that's what would that's what you get if uh, you were trying to connect to uh, port 22 on something that didn't actually have anything bound on port 22. So I just I stopped the SSH service on uh, this host and then uh, tried to send a, a TCP connect over. Uh, and then it uh, it just sends a, a reset act back because it has nothing bound to that port. And then the last option is nothing replying at all. Uh, so if, if you see something along these lines where, in this case, trying try to connect to uh, port 24, which there uh, was nothing listening on and the host uh, was firewalling it off, so this the same sin just keeps getting sent over and over again. Uh, how many times depends on the uh, the application and um, how persistent it is about uh, keeping the try. But most things will be somewhere in the neighborhood of three to six tries or so, and then they'll uh, just stop if they don't get anything back. Uh, UDP is a connectionless protocol, so there's no uh, connection setup. Uh, it just blasts data over across to uh, whatever the destination is. Some UDP services uh, will require a, a reply back to the uh, data that's sent out, like DNS and NTP, for instance. Uh, so you'll send out a, a DNS query, and then you'll get the, uh, the query's reply back uh, via that uh, essentially the same way as a uh, kind of the same way as a TCP connection functions in that it flips the source and destination. We'll uh, see that here in a minute. But some uh, UDP traffic is just silently accepted, like uh, syslog, for instance. Um, syslog servers will just accept the traffic, or for all you know, it may have disappeared somewhere between uh, you and the server, or the server may be overloaded, not actually uh, picking up the traffic, or uh, something along those lines. So uh, you don't necessarily always get any kind of reply back whatsoever with UDP. So certain UDP protocols, uh, getting nothing back in response is is normal. It doesn't necessarily indicate that there's a problem. Uh, that's not true for things along the lines of DNS and NTP, where they uh, you, where you do have to get a response for for things to work. So similarly, um, UDP has basically three different scenarios that you might see in a packet capture. Uh, the first and one of the main differences uh, with TCP is either it's accepted or it's filtered traffic. So the uh, 
line here with uh, port 10 UDP. That's that's from Nmap. And uh, every now and again, we have somebody show up on our forum who says, "Oh, Nmap says, oh my UDP ports are open. The the sky is falling." But uh, what that really means is they're either open or they're filtered. So uh, in the case of UDP, because there isn't a connection establishment process and uh, some UDP services will not reply back to you at all. Uh, it's just the way they function. Uh, it, the Nmap and any other kind of uh, port scanner can't know the difference between whether the port is open and it just doesn't reply, or if it's blocked by a firewall. So this is what uh, one example for uh, you know, port 10 trying to connect on a on an IP that uh, has that firewall off. So it's uh, it's filtered in that case. And then the second possibility is actually rejecting the traffic. So if you don't have a firewall on the host and uh, you send uh, traffic to a UDP port that has nothing bound to it, uh, it will send back a, a port unreachable. So there's a trying to send to UDP port 17 just to pick something at random, and then the reply back from that device is uh, ICMP on that IP, UDP port 17 unreachable. Most OSs will reply back uh, with that message if um, there is nothing listening on that port, unless they have a firewall enabled, and in that case, generally they won't. And it can also just be turned off even if you don't have a, a firewall enabled. So this is a circumstance where you know the port is closed. Uh, and if you did an end map on that, it would show up as closed. And then the, the third circumstance is something that actually receives a reply back. So in this uh, example, this is uh, just a DNS query. So just did a, a lookup for Google.com for its A record. And then the, that uh, machine replied back with all of the A records that uh, Google.com resolves to. Okay, and uh, now moving on to the ICMP. Um, ICMP has a, a variety of types. Uh, the, the one that most people are, are most familiar with is uh, ping. Uh, there are no ports in, uh, in ICMP. It's, uh, it, its types are, are differentiated by the, the type code, which there are about 40 some odd of those uh, defined, uh, but not generally that many that are actually used all that much. Uh, for the sake of keeping the scope uh, limited to things you'll see relatively Frequently in these circumstances, we're just going to uh, stick with uh, well, ping in this in this case. So, uh, ping is actually two parts of, of ICMP. It's uh, two different types. So whenever you send a request out, uh, that's a ICMP echo request. So this is uh, initiating a ping out to Google. And then whenever the reply comes back, uh, it uh, flips the source and destination IPs, and it's a different ICMP type. It's an echo reply. The ID will uh, match up between them, and generally will stay the same uh, between the entire run of uh, a ping. So if you have it running constantly, it uh, would stay the same. And then the sequence number uh, will increment with uh, each packet that it's sent, so that's how it tells uh, which uh, request it's actually getting replies for. Okay, I'm going to uh, pull up the packet capture page in the uh, in the web interface.
I added the rounds back to this machine. I had to reboot it just before we got started here. Yeah. Okay, the page in the web interface is um, under Diagnostics and Packet Capture. And the first drop down is the interface that you will be capturing traffic on. So it uh, fills in all of the assigned interfaces that are on the system. And uh, if you have uh, like OpenVPN instances, it'll put uh, individual entries in there for those. Um, if you have IPsec enabled, it will have. Uh, uh, an entry there for IPsec as well, so you can capture uh, traffic within the uh, VPN that way. Uh, promiscuous mode is uh, allows you to pick up all the traffic that the NIC can see, regardless of whether or not it's actually destined to the firewall. Uh, in most instances, it doesn't really matter whether or not you do that, because you're probably on a switch network, and the traffic that you care about is probably destined to or from the uh, the firewall, so it'll pick it up uh, either way. Uh, but if you want to make sure you pick up everything that's that's on the wire, um, you'll want to check uh, that box there. The address family lets you specify whether you want to do v4 or v6 only, or if you just want any protocol. And then the protocol box allows you to pick uh, ICMP, ICMPv6, TCP, UDP, etc. So you get some ability to filter uh, with these. It's possible to filter significantly more um, if you do it at the command line, which we'll talk about in a bit. The host address, if you put an IP in here, it will filter the capture to only traffic that is to or from the uh, specified IP. So if you have a lot of traffic on your network, uh, it's really important to filter it down as much as you can to not get lost in just a flood of completely unrelated things. So if there's a specific source or destination IP that you're looking to, to troubleshoot, you'll want to fill in the host address uh, accordingly for that. Uh, if you want to capture either TCP or UDP traffic, you can fill in a, a port number. If you leave the, the protocol to any here and fill in a port, it will get uh, both TCP and UDP traffic uh, using that port. Or if you put in a specific protocol here of uh, TCP or UDP and then you put a, a port number, it will only be that specific protocol. The packet length is how much of the packet that it actually saves. So it, we default to zero, which means it will capture the entire frame, uh, no matter how big it is, and that may be desirable in, in some cases if you're going to do a longer term uh, capture, or if you're in any kind of circumstance where you really don't care if you have the uh, the payload, you're just interested in the headers, uh, putting something smaller in there, like maybe 64, uh, would be possibly more, more reasonable. That uh, doesn't affect the output unless you actually download the capture, so it's just how much it saves uh, in the capture file. The count is how many packets it will grab before it stops automatically. Um, if you put zero in there, it will keep running until you tell it to stop. The uh, level of the tail, uh, that's the... TCP dump level of detail that it will show in the text output after you uh, stop the capture. If you actually download the capture, it has no impact uh, on that at all. It's uh, only what it shows you uh, as a text representation in the uh, web interface here. 
and the reverse DNS lookup uh, that will do a pointer lookup on all the IP addresses and replace them with their uh, reverse DNS entries if they have one. That's uh, usually not something that uh, is desirable. It, it adds delays, and a lot of times your reverse DNS is not necessarily very accurate or, or really very telling, uh, depending on whether you're capturing on public or private. It could be controlled by your ISP and, and not uh, really be anything that uh, that you recognize. So usually uh, not something that you need there. So after you fill in all the values there, you can click start at the bottom. And then it will either run forever if you told it count zero, or it'll run until it, it reaches the count. And then uh, once you load the page again, um, if it had a, a count limit on it and it stopped, it will show you uh, at the bottom the, the results of that capture. And then it also gives you the ability to download the capture file. So if you want to open it up in Wireshark, you can easily do so. The other option is uh, to, to take a look at traffic that's on the wire is TCP dump at the command line. So what the web interface is actually running on the back end is TCP dump. You can SSH in, go to option 8 to get a command prompt, and run it manually, as well as another uh, option. There's a, a whole slew of different options and various things that you can make it do. It's very powerful. You can check out the, the FreeBSD man page if you want uh, all the details. But there's a, there's a handful that are... Uh, more commonly used, the uh, dash i tells it which interface that you're wanting to capture traffic on. Uh, dash n will disable reverse DNS lookups, which is, in my opinion, probably even more important at the command line because you see the traffic coming through more or less in real time. But if you don't specify the the dash n, it won't. If your reverse DNS lookups are delayed uh, to any extent, it's not going to show up at more or less the same time it shows up on the wire. It'll sit there and try to do the lookup, and it may be seconds later, potentially, uh, before it actually shows up. So it's just a lot easier if you're looking at it uh, in real time at the command line to make sure that it shows up as quickly as possible. Uh, dash E will show the, the link level header, which uh, for most purposes for what uh, you guys will probably be interested in and that shows MAC addresses, source and destination MAC, and it shows VLAN tags, which is very helpful when troubleshooting uh, any kind of VLAN setup that you're trying to do on the firewall. You can see whether or not the uh, the firewall is tagging its traffic outbound, and if the the switch is tagging its traffic that's coming um, in on that uh, that NIC. And the last two options are relevant if you want to capture to a file uh, at the command line. So dash S is the snap length, and that's uh, how much of each frame it uh, will save to the uh, resulting capture file. And then dash W will uh, specify what uh, what file to save the output to. So if you don't specify uh, either of, or the, if you don't specify dash W, at least it will spit it out um, at the command line. TCPDump has a lot of options for filtering traffic in a wide variety of ways. Uh, some people I've, I see piping TCP dump to grep, and that's, uh, eh, I, I guess if you're in a bind and you, you can't figure out the, uh, the TCP dump filter quickly enough, it, it might work, but that's really not a great way to do it. Uh, there are filters that, uh, that you can use that are much more accurate and, uh, allow you to do a lot more than what you could hack together by piping it out to grab. A few of the, the common filters, um, if you use host and then uh, an IP address, uh, it includes that host, anything to or from it. Um, something like port 53 will include uh, port 53 TCP and UDP traffic. Um, if you 
specifically want just UDP, you can do UDP port 53, then it will ignore uh, any TCP there. Or if you only want uh, TCP, you can do TCP like port 80. And then you combine filters with AND or OR, uh, and you can negate uh, any of the other filters by using NOT. So if you want to do capture everything except one particular host, you can do NOT host 1.2.3.4, and it'll like exclude that uh, from your capture. So a few examples of uh, using TCP though. If you just want to display all traffic that's on interface EM0 with no reverse DNS resolution, it's just TCP dump dash NI space EM0. Uh, you do have to know the physical uh, interface, and you'll you'll see that after you SSH in the console menu shows you your you know, LAN is assigned to uh, whatever the underlying uh, physical interface is. And to display any traffic to or from 1.2.3.4 on EM0 and include the link layer, uh, the, the source and destination MAC addresses, any VLAN tags if they're there, uh, TCP dump dash NEI EM0 host 1.2.3.4. Uh, similar for uh, DNS traffic, you just pick your uh, interface. If you're using uh, tagged VLANs, then you'll have an interface something along the lines of EM1 underscore VLAN5 if you have a VLAN ID5 whose parent NIC is uh, EM1 then uh, that would be your interface name in that case. And uh, just put the, the port that you want to see on the end there. And then if you want to see all TCP port 80 traffic, um, except that uh, to or from 10.005, then you can do uh, TCP dump NIEM0 TCP port 80 and not host 10.005. And you can get a, a lot more complex with the, the filters and combining AND and OR and, and things along that line, those lines. Uh, that's more than we have time to really dig into. Uh, but there's a lot of good resources out there if you, you just do, uh, read the man page of TCP dump and, and do some searching on uh, fil uh, filtering with TCP dump. It's, there's a, a lot of flexibility that you get there. So when should you use uh, the web interface packet capture versus using TCP dump? Uh, in a lot of cases, it really doesn't matter either way. They can both accomplish the, the same end result. Uh, but there are circumstances where one is, is possibly better than the other, or one can do things that the other one can't. The, uh, the web packet capture is just a little easier to select the interface since you don't actually have to look at the console menu and see, oh, okay, my my LAN is actually, you know, EM4 underscore VLAN 42. Uh, you can just click it from the, the drop down and uh, not have to, to poke around a little bit to find the, uh, the actual interface. Uh, ease of doing basic filtering, uh, if you're not really comfortable with uh, TCP dumps filtering, we've got some good options to do uh, basic host and protocol and port and those kinds of things uh, very easily in the uh, the web interface part. Uh, one of the reasons that I use it uh, over TCP dump at times is it's really easy to save a capture file and download it, especially if you're already logged into the web interface. So you want to go uh, capture a traffic that you're going to need to pull into Wireshark to, to analyze for something. Uh, the, the web packet capture is much easier to deal with um, in that circumstance than TCP dump. Yeah, you can do it with TCP dump. You have to you know, specify the file name and then go SCP the file off. And yeah, it's just it's just extra hoops to jump through that uh, are generally unnecessary. But on the flip side, if you uh, if you need real time output, the the web based packet capture does not have that uh, at this time. Sometimes it's Easier to troubleshoot certain issues if you can see things exactly as they're happening and not have this to go stop the capture and then see it after the fact. Uh, if you need really flexible filtering, um, if it's a more complex scenario and um, a busy network, you, you may need to, to filter much more granularly than what the, uh, 
the web packet capture can do and in that case um, the uh, command line TCP dump is a, uh, a better bet and if you sometimes in some circumstances you might want to run multiple uh, captures at the same time and the the web packet capture you can only run uh, one and you have to stop that one and then uh, restart a different one to get a, a capture on another interface. So with the TCP dump, you can open up however many SSH sessions you want and launch however many instances of a TCP dump you'd like, and uh, that can be helpful in, in, in some cases. Okay, one of the uh, things that I tend to use the packet capture for um, in the web interface is uh, Somebody calls up and they're like, ah, I've got all this bandwidth usage going on in my network. Uh, they don't have a bandwidth D or an NTOP or NetFlow export or anything else to really be able to, to drill down uh, what exactly is, is happening. So it's really easy to grab a, a packet capture. And you probably want to do it on your internal um, interfaces, because uh, that way you can actually see the internal source IP rather than what it's getting natted to. It just makes it much easier to track down what's actually going on. And you probably want to leave everything blank and at defaults, uh, with the exception of the packet length. You're probably okay with uh, with 64 there, because you don't really don't need the the full payload. You can get enough information uh, just with a, a smaller portion and count you may want to fill in um, you, you'll want to make it more than 100 if you if you do yeah I will usually set it to zero and hit start and let it run for a, a few seconds generally and then hit stop and uh, and download the capture from there I don't actually have uh, any real world internet traffic there to show you so I got a capture file on uh, my other machine that um, I can show you to, to illustrate what you would then do from there So this is uh, a capture that I grabbed off of my uh, my home network, and there's all kinds of traffic going on. And if you just take this packet capture and just look at it at a glance, you have tens of thousands of packets here, and at at a glance, it's just not something that you can make any kind of sense of. So where where Wireshark comes in handy is it has the statistics capabilities where you can go to conversations and the, at the Ethernet level it shows you uh, between any between given uh, MAC addresses how much traffic that they've sent back and forth uh, usually in circumstances like this it's easiest to go to IPv4 and if you just sort by bytes you'll usually find the culprit right at the very top so that device has sent uh, far more traffic than anything else so that if you go you can apply that as a filter you can just do 
A to B. And we can see here that the source is an Apple MAC address. And this IP. If you do a uh, who is look up on there. Which you can do it at command line at any Unix like machine or uh, uh, if you just go to Aaron's website, you can uh, use their whois.aaron.net. And we see that uh, that IP belongs to Netflix. So uh, I already know from there that that's, uh, that's, that's my Apple TV that was uh, streaming something off of Netflix, and that was what was using up the uh, vast majority of my bandwidth at the time. So that's a uh, quick and easy way, if you don't have anything set up to... Uh, gather like longer term stats if you want to see what's happening at this moment on uh, on your network what's what's consuming bandwidth uh, that's uh, that's a good way to do it and VPN troubleshooting is another area where uh, where things come in handy so you have uh, at, at minimum six different points of reference that you can capture traffic from. So if you are initiating traffic from client one uh, over to client two, then you could you can start at the source machine. Uh, just make sure that the source device is actually sending the traffic out, and then its next hop, which would be the uh, the source side's LAN, and then the source side firewall's VPN interface. So you if you see it coming into LAN, you can make sure that it's actually leaving via the VPN. Then hopping over to the other side, uh, the fourth point, the uh, destination side uh, firewall on its VPN interface, so that way you can see if it's uh, making it across to the other side. And then the, the LAN on the opposite side to see if it's, um, if it's leaving LAN there. And then all the way down to the destination machine. Now you generally don't really need to capture from six different spots to uh, find out where the traffic is going, but uh, normally you can skip the source machine because it's usually safe to assume it's getting to the, the land side, but there's uh, ways to check that that we'll uh, go over here in just a moment. So we have uh, an IPsec connection here, which is not enabled yet. So we didn't want it to uh, pass any traffic across yet. So what we have in the network is uh, just the two LANs that we're uh, interested in in this case. So there's uh, site A's firewall one. And then site B. Uh, so we'll just do the 10.5.1.0 the uh, slash 24 here. And the opposite end has 10.6.1.0 slash 24 on it. And I could have just as easily picked LAN 1 there. It's just sometimes I like to type it in just because it's, uh, it, it's more clear, uh, clearly seen in that case.
And then this is the other side. most ideal settings to use regardless of any circumstances. Uh, just something that will work for uh, the sake of illustrating what we're, uh, what we're doing here. If you go back to the, uh, the earlier hangout that we did in IPsec, we went through all of that, uh, all that stuff there in, in much more detail. Okay on both sides, so let's see if we can pass some traffic across it. So this is the client uh, here on this side, and we're going to try to go across the client on the uh, on the remote. So I've got them all connected in together by terminaling into the, uh, the actual virtual machines that are running. But this is functionally equivalent to if uh, this client 2 was at one office and uh, the client 1 was at an entirely different one. is up, but uh, we're not able to pass traffic across. Let's, uh, I know why, but let's go, uh, let's go troubleshoot to see where it's getting where it's not. We could start out just by uh, doing a packet capture on LAN here. I usually like to skip the states first, and uh, then if you just filter on uh, either the source or destination uh, IPs there. Okay, so this shows us that the uh, connection is getting in. This is the, the inbound state and uh, this is the outbound state. So it's definitely getting to land since it's uh, getting that state and it's getting passed out somewhere since it has an outbound state. It's probably safe to assume it's uh, getting passed out over IPsec, uh, but we can do a, a quick capture on IPsec just to verify. Yep, there we see the uh, echo requests are leaving, and we're not getting any echo replies back. So we'll go over to the other site. And we can check the IPsec interface here. So is it is it making it across uh, over to this end? And it is. So you've at least confirmed that the, the VPN is, is fine and then at that point because the traffic you're sending out of the, uh, the other side is reaching this side. And if you just go check and see if it has a, a state, you can just filter on ICMP or uh, 
10, 5, 1, since that's the network on the, the opposite side. So there aren't any states here. So we're, we're not passing that traffic. So more than likely, we'll see it uh, blocked in the firewall log unless you've disabled uh, logging of the default block rule. Or if you've made a configure some block rules that don't have uh, logging enabled. And yeah, here you can see on the IPsec interface, we are blocking traffic uh, from the remote to this side. And if we go check our firewall rules on uh, IPsec, we don't have any. So that's what it uh, what it should be doing. So uh, we'll just open it up, which may or may not be what you want. Um, most companies, if it's strictly between internal offices, will leave it wide open because there's so many things that they uh, need to be allowed to communicate between. But the, you maybe want to uh, restrict that tighter than, than what I am here. And then we are navigating ping replies. And to the LAN as well. So VPN is essentially no different um, in that case where if you uh, you have the same uh, points of reference to capture from, uh, it's just the OpenVPN instance instead of the IPsec instance. And you'll notice in the packet capture screen, uh, wherever you have VPNs enabled, uh, OpenVPN has an individual entry for every single server and client instance that uh, that you have. It's just kind of the nature of how it works because it has a, a, a unique interface for each of those uh, connections. With IPsec, you have a, a single uh, ENC0 interface. So whenever you go to the uh, packet capture, you if you are capturing something on OpenVPN, you will only get traffic on that specific OpenVPN server. Uh, but if you're capturing on IPsec, that will include any and all uh, IPsec tunnels that you have on this device. So uh, if you have a, a lot of other IPsec traffic uh, going on, you're just trying to troubleshoot one uh, specific new one or one host in particular or something like that, you want to make sure that you uh, use at least a host address filter so you can uh, cut out all the uh, noise that's not, uh, not relevant to, to what you're looking at. And port forward troubleshooting is another very common and, and very good use of uh, packet capture. If, if you can trace down all the various spots that the uh, uh, traffic should be and, and where it actually ends up, that's uh, very helpful in figuring out what's getting where and, and where the problem may actually reside. So we have a server over here. which is intentionally not configured because we're going to uh, use that to our advantage here. So it has an IP that's on the uh, the 10.5.2 network, which is LAN 2 of uh, site A. And it can hit the firewall. As a web server running, for the moment we will stop it. Okay. 
So we're going to forward 80 on the, the WAN address to uh, that server's IP and 80 on it as well. And we'll use the associated filter rule. Okay, and the WAN address here is uh, this. So if we go to HTTP on that IP, we should get where we forwarded it to. But there is a problem. So let's see, where is the traffic uh, is getting? Is it even getting here at all? So if you put in the the IP and the colon 80 behind it, that'll catch the uh, the port 80 traffic that we're trying to forward through. The uh, state shows closed sin sent, which uh, means the client sent the sin across. Uh, it got to the WAN IP. The firewall forwarded it into the internal device, and it did not reply. So since we do see a state, we can safely skip the, uh, the WAN side capture, but just to uh, illustrate that and how that should look. So you probably want to put in your WAN address there, and uh, port 80 is fine. And 100. There's not really any other traffic that's going to match that, so that's plenty. And you don't really have to wait for it to time out. It'll sit there and try many, many times, and you only need three or four seconds or so to actually see that there's traffic coming in that is uh, useful. And if you set this to full, uh, you get the uh, layer two details, uh, the source and destination MAC address in particular is uh, useful in this case. So there's traffic coming in, and uh, in a typical internet scenario, the uh, the first MAC address here would be your next top router, so that'd be your, your ISP's router. And then the destination MAC address should be your, your WAN interface's uh, MAC. So if you go check status interfaces, my WAN's MAC here is uh, 38DC25, and that matches here, 38DC25. So that much is good. Um, if you see traffic coming in like this and it's not actually destined to a, a MAC that's on the firewall, um, if it's not at the WAN interface's MAC or if you're using CARP, it uses uh, virtual MAC addresses. If it's uh, neither of those, then you have uh, probably a, a, a steel upstream ARP cache and you'll have to either power cycle your modem or uh, in the case of other types of connectivity, you may have to contact your provider to get them to uh, clear that for you so they pick up the, uh, the change back if you're switching out devices. Or it could be if you have a, a, another device that is actively using that IP. So in that case it may flip-flop back and forth between them depending on uh, which ARP reply the uh, upstream router picks up faster. So we know it's getting there so let's uh, Let's switch to LAN, or LAN 2 in this case, that's where the server uh, resides. And that host address no longer exists once it actually uh, sends it to the internal network, so it rewrites that to the server's IP. And we'll just refresh this again. And it's long enough to get the uh, some packets. And you see it is getting passed out uh, to the LAN. And if you check uh, Diagnostics ARP, just to verify that uh, that destination MAC address. So now that it's now that it's going out the uh, the other 
side, the source MAC is this firewall's MAC address on that uh, uh, interface, and the destination is the destination host's uh, MAC address. So that E2 uh, 9BD4. is what we have for 2.10. So it looks from here like it's going to the correct host. So let's go back over to that actual host. And it is E29BD4. So it should be getting this traffic, uh, but it doesn't seem to be replying to it at all. So uh, let's capture right on this host. Make sure it's actually getting to here and see what happens from there. And since the server has nothing else going on at the moment, don't really need to uh, filter anything. And we do see that it is getting here. And it's not even trying to respond. It's not actually sending anything out at all. So in that case, uh, even if it was listening on uh, on that port or uh, something along those lines, it, usually it's uh, some sort of routing issue. So if you, uh, on Linux or BSD, if you do netstat-rn or route-n, get default just to check and see what your default route is. There is no default route. So if we uh, add the appropriate default route, so it actually has a way to route out to other hosts. And now it, it didn't succeed, but you can see it timed out very quickly. So that tells me that the connection probably got rejected. So let's go back and, and look and see if that uh, that is actually the case. Uh, we'll st still stick with LAN2 here. Uh, we'll keep everything else the same. And there's our sin, and we're getting a reset act back. So that means nothing on that server is listening on port 80. So if we go back to that machine, and then socks that dash 4 and BSD will show you um, what is listening on IPv4 ports. Uh, or Netstat um, on Linux and Netstat on BSD can show the uh, same thing as well. And there's nothing running, so do we have not have a HTTP process? No, we don't. So let's actually start the web server. And then we actually have a web server running. And we have something that's listening on port 80. So now if we go back uh, to the client side, There we go. That's the page that it's uh, that it's serving. So it's another illustration there of, of how to look at, at various different points of reference. Start at the, as close to the source as you feel necessary. Uh, in this case, we just started on WAN at the uh, at the firewall. If the, we wouldn't have actually seen anything on WAN, then we may have got, had to go back and get uh, closer to the original client and maybe the firewall that it's behind and uh, or, or something along those lines. But uh, starting on the WAN of the device where you're capturing is a, uh, usually a good place to start. Most of the time you will probably see the, uh, see the traffic there. And then what you see or what you don't see back uh, will help you determine you know, what the what the source of the issue is. If you're getting a, a reset act uh, in response to your sin, that's because nothing's actually bound to the port. Um, if you're not getting anything back, that's probably either a routing issue on the actual machine. Maybe you don't have a default gateway. Maybe the default gateway is pointing somewhere 
else, uh, so it's misrouting the uh, reply traffic or maybe a, a host firewall uh, on that device that's uh, causing it to not, not reply back. And routing troubleshooting is uh, similar to, to what we looked at before, kind of similar to, to what we saw with, uh, with VPNs, uh, some of the same concepts there. To have a uh, different kind of symptom, we'll make a change on the server here. So the uh, client machine is uh, this one here, and the server machine is this one here. So we're we're going from one LAN to another uh, within the same site. Okay, and we do not seem to be able to ping it. So we can start at the uh, at states again. And there we see the two directions of the traffic. So it is coming into and getting passed out of uh, this machine. So we're safe to not worry about capturing on uh, LAN 1 in this case, but let's capture on LAN 2 and see is that where it's actually leaving, and, uh, and what does it look like. In this case, you could filter on either the, the source or the destination address. Uh, since we have little other traffic, uh, we could have just as easily left it blank. But uh, in most networks, you'll have enough other chatter going on that it, it'd be hard to sort through uh, the, the results if you didn't uh, specify one of the addresses there. So here you have your echo request. That's the, the ping going out. Uh, it is destined out to the correct MAC address. It is going to that host. But then we see every time that happens, we get an ARP request. Who has this IP to uh, that server? That IP isn't local. It shouldn't be trying to ARP anything that's off of its own subnet. So if you ever see something, some device that's uh, on a separate subnet and it, a device is trying to ARP that, uh, that's pretty much a guarantee that it's got a wrong subnet mask. It's also possible to mess up uh, host routing tables in interesting ways to kind of cause the same circumstance, but almost always it's uh, an issue with the subnet mask. You see the this is a slash 8 mask, so it thinks 10.x.x.x is all uh, local networks. So it will never reply back um, to the its default gateway to reach the uh, the other side because it doesn't have uh, uh, it doesn't realize that that's reachable via the router. And if you do a 
route that and get uh, 1051 one, for instance. It'll show you that uh, it is a local network in that case. So you would uh, actually want to see the uh, default gateway probably in this case, uh, which, so if we put back uh, Back the proper mask, and uh, those were messing with it manually. We're going to put the gateway back as well. And then we started getting ping replies as soon as we did that. And you can see now, instead of uh, trying to, to ARP the destination IP, it knows that it needs to go back to its uh, gateway, which you can see the MAC that it's sending it to, the destination MAC is the uh, 6CBC10, which is uh, the MAC address of 2.1, which is its default gateway, so that's, uh, that's good. Uh, I grabbed a, a couple of packet captures that I've gotten uh, from real-world support circumstances in the past. Uh, ran them through an anonymizer that randomizes all the, the IPs and, and wipes out all the payload data, so you don't quite see everything, but you can see the, the things that matter. Uh, the first one we'll look at is a uh, case of a, a customer that called up that, oh, my firewalls are down, they're they're dropping traffic, and, and as many times happens that wasn't quite exactly the case. I mean, I guess if you count the in a low end firewall getting blasted with 50,000 new connections per second from a compromised server that was trying to attack somebody else, taking your firewall down, then that, um, yeah, uh, the firewall's fault in that case, but uh, that's uh, just the, the nature of uh, how a low end firewall is going to uh, react to an infected server on your network that, that goes crazy. But it took a bit to actually figure out, okay, what is that issue? You could see it was under a whole lot of load, and it was dropping packets like crazy. And you could, I could tell from uh, the output at top that the, the bulk of it was on one specific NIC, just judging by the, the task queue uh, CPU utilization. So got uh, as much as of a packet capture as I could off of it. Um, it was having a lot of trouble even capturing the uh, the traffic that was there but it was at least uh, at least was able to get a thousand packets out of it and then also here a good place to start is the uh, statistics conversations and IPv4 And in this case, we may not want bytes, uh, just by the nature of what this kind of attack does to your network. Uh, there's not a whole lot of other things that are gonna, going to successfully uh, pass too many things through. And that is generally where I start, but there's nothing too terrible looking about uh, the first one there. The second one really sticks out because it's more packets than anything else, and it has zero in the opposite direction. So that's... At, at least a misbehaving host, um, and almost certainly uh, something that's attacking uh, someone else. So after you see that, then uh, you can apply that as a filter, selected, and uh, A to B, or vice versa. And that's where you see a whole slew of uh, DNS requests, which are just X'd out to zeros now since it's been anonymized, but it was uh, a website in particular that was under a, a DDoS attack and a uh, compromised cPanel server was blasting it uh, with all kinds of traffic. And then once we found that, uh, got a block firewall rule uh, in on the LAN to uh, stop it from actually passing that traffic because if it doesn't pass it, it's not 
quite as much uh, impact on the on the system. It'll, it'll behave a little bit better in that case, and that was enough that they could get in and um, actually shut the machine down and uh, figure out what happened and clean it up and uh, get it back online. And one case study that actually has nothing to do with a, a network problem at all, but I thought it was a, an interesting illustration of how you can take a packet capture and one, show that it's actually not a network problem, and two, give uh, people a really good idea of where the problem actually is. So the description um, of this particular issue was, you know, throughput's just all over the place. Firewall's slowing stuff down. It, it it ramps up and it drops off and it ramps up and drops off and over and over and over again. And the firewall must be slowing down all the traffic. So get packet capture. And uh, in this case, I want to see throughput before anything else, uh, just to see if that description has any basis in reality. So if you go under statistics and uh, IOGRAPH. And wow, yeah, indeed. So it's uh, packets per tick uh, by default, which the tick interval is one second, so this is packets per second. Uh, if we change it to uh, bits per tick instead, that's uh, bits per second. So and we're getting a, a bit over you know, 1.2 megabits per second, and it drops off down to nothing, back up, down, up, down, up, down. So there's definitely something unusual going on there. I mean, you'll always see some degree of, of variance uh, in, in throughput, uh, but that's just really unusual. So the next place I always like to look in, in circumstances like that is uh, go under Analyze and Expert Info. And this checks for a, a wide range of errors, warnings, and other other things that uh, it can automatically detect um, wrong in the capture. And it usually helps you narrow down pretty quickly and, and, and easily without really digging in too terribly far uh, what the uh, what the source of the issue is. So no errors in this case. But if you go over to warnings, TCP windows full, 36-0 window. So that's that's suspicious. Uh, maybe not depending on the exact circumstance, but in this case, okay, let's go find uh, one of these in particular. So this is in uh, frame 661. If we do a follow TCP stream on here. It's nothing but dots in here because the, that's just what the uh, anonymizer puts into the uh, capture, but you can start to see here things just fall apart towards the end, and uh, eventually it just gives up and and resets the connection to to close it off. Now if you look a little bit further above that, you can see that the the server side as it's sending it back to the client, its TCP window keeps dropping. So the TCP window value is um, how much unacknowledged TCP traffic that you're allowed to have in transit. So that number should really not decrease near zero in most circumstances where you have a uh, fast network and everything is uh, performing the, the way that it should. You'll see in you know, a lot of these packets, it's a, window, it, it's a Windows server. In this case, it's a default 65536. Uh, and it does that for a period of time. But then as you get right above where things fall apart, you see that every time it acts, its window size drops, 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 to where eventually it gets to nothing. So it's th that is not, a, not an issue with the network. Uh, the window sizes are not you know, controlled by anything other than the, uh, the endpoint devices in uh, most cases, and this one in particular. So there is some reason that the server is not telling the client to send it more data. 
and then what happens is the client gives up on the connection, it opens up a new connection, it hits the same zero window, and falls apart, opens up another connection. So that's exactly what that up and down and up and down, over and over pattern uh, was caused by. And at the time, I just kind of guessed, just on gut instinct and seeing similar kinds of things before, that it was probably some kind of application that was exhausting its buffers or, or waiting for something or, or something along those lines. Uh, started doing a bit of searching on Windows and uh, hitting uh, a zero TCP window and found some other people who had run into essentially exactly the same thing uh, in circumstances such as there was a really slow database query and the application was waiting for the uh, the response back from the SQL Server before it could do anything and that would cause uh, the same kind of uh, circumstance and uh, a, a whole range of other things but uh, just knowing this and seeing that there is no packet loss whatsoever in this capture so that essentially rules out network level issues and that it consistently got to a certain point of transferring a certain amount of data and then it let its window size get down to zero that tells me in that case it's a Windows server and uh, what the type of application it was using it's uh, that means there was some kind of problem with the application itself and uh, going back to the customer with that um, information they were able to track it down and figure out what the, the application problem was and uh, once that was fixed, uh, all was well. Now those, especially that last one is probably not something with a, a, a basic level of knowledge you're going to be able to uh, troubleshoot with a high degree of, of success uh, if you're just getting started in, in looking at these kinds of things. But, uh, it's just a, a good example of uh, you know how how to apply the the troubleshooting process through those things and you know, the more that you look through that and and work on such things and and look at what the certain problem scenarios uh, cause and what what symptoms and how things act under certain conditions you can uh, gain enough knowledge and uh, to you know troubleshoot some of the more um, advanced things. Yeah, any questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, Jim Pingle noted that uh, on 2.2 he added uh, negation, so not on the uh, for the host port uh, protocol combination, and he also added some uh, and or logic for the host. Yeah, I, I, I'm always very happy to see more filtering uh, capabilities come uh, come up in that screen there. Uh, just sometimes you're already in the web interface, and all you really need to get into SSH for is to have a better filter, um, and if you can just do it without uh, without leaving the interface, that's much uh, much easier to deal with in my cases. Uh, question, is there a, a strategy for using this to estimate link utilization and network congestion for first and second hop out? Uh, you, you can't really necessarily tell where congestion happens. Um, if you do get a, a packet capture on WAN, for instance, and uh, you see that there are TCP retransmissions and uh, you know, other things that indicate there are uh, some type of, of issue at some point um, upstream, you can definitely troubleshoot a, a performance problem that way just by uh, being able to analyze it and look at the expert info. It'll uh, Anytime you have loss, it'll uh, show you some uh, big warnings there and errors there. So that is a, a good way to at least determine if you're having any kind of network performance issue. Um, if you don't see any kind of TCP retransmissions or uh, duplicate acts or anything along that line, then you probably are not having uh, any issues at the uh, the network level, at least as far as not no uh, packet loss. Uh, but it can't really tell you where 
the loss is occurring. That's uh, that's where other tools like uh, MTR, uh, for instance, which is a, a more advanced trace route, can can help. Um, you have to know how to interpret their output um, as well, but that's a reasonable uh, way if you understand you know, what what it's telling you to. Uh, check that and things like trace route and, and similar but MTR is a little more a uh, little, little better to, to track down that kind of thing Other questions? I put all you to sleep, or uh, did I just you know, teach you everything that you could have possibly wanted to need or, or desire here? <laughs> People in the chat say they're awake. <laughs> all right, since there's uh, no other questions coming in, I'll uh, go ahead and uh, stop. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for attending. Uh, the recording will, one way or another, definitely be up later today. Uh, we've got two different things uh, recording the session. Uh, technical difficulties. The uh, the last time uh, we had to, re I, I had to go back and and re-record the whole session because the whole recording got uh, got messed up. But uh, two different sources this time. One or the other is bound to work. Knock on wood. All right, we will uh, see you guys next month and probably on our forum or elsewhere uh, in between. Thanks for joining us. Recording of the conference has stopped. Same number one as uh, that's, there you go. That's a good. <laughs>